Hello and good morning if you're joining us from uh, the United States. Good afternoon if you're joining us from Europe or further east. Um, welcome to our panel discussion here today. Uh, we're going to be discussing the scourge of foreign interference in local affairs. My name is Amanda Cooper. I am the uh, markets editor at Business Insider here in the United Kingdom. And I'd like to introduce our uh, wonderful panelists today. We have with us Dinesh Damija, who is founder and chairman of the Copper Beach Group here in the United Kingdom. Dinesh was a member for the Europe, at the European Parliament for the Liberal Democrats until uh, the advent of Brexit and is a British Indian business entrepreneur. He's best known as the founder of online travel agency eBookers. With us also is Marius, Marius Ephthimiopoulos, who is Chief Executive Officer of Strategy International based in Cyprus. Marius is an expert on global security with a particular emphasis on NATO issues. Um, before we get started and before I uh, let our guests get uh, begin, I would, if you forgive me, like to take a minute to just say that all of us that take part in harassment events pride ourselves on our impartiality and objectivity. But I did just want to take a few minutes for us to express our solidarity with the people of Ukraine and all the innocent victims of the terrible crisis that we are witnessing today. Let's hope that somehow peace can once again be restored to Europe. So on that note, um, I would like us to begin. The topic we're going to be discussing is very broad, very wide, and we are so lucky to have such uh, two amazing guests to discuss this with us today. Um, Dinesh, I'd like to say hello to you first. Thank you very much for joining us. Um, Pleasure. And um, Marius, thank you too. Um, I thought I'd, I'd begin by, I said this topic is very wide ranging, but it's impossible to talk about anything to do with security without um, without talking about the kind of the Russia Ukraine crisis that we're looking at right now. Marius, you've um, worked closely with governments as an advisor. You've lectured on security. You uh, have a particular focus on NATO. How does what we're seeing today fit in with this, this, you know, our topic of conversation, which is um, foreign interference in local affairs? Well, I have a feeling that foreign interference was a level one, if you want, step of the possibilities and the issues that would come at a later stage. You have to understand that before any kind of operation of, of any kind, political or military, the preparation of the wider public is really needed. It seems that Russia has been engaged into this propaganda of preparation of possibility of war, especially since 2014 that, you know, the the separatists took, took over, if you want, the, the, the future of Donetsk and Luhansk in Ukraine, uh, while at the same time they were investing a lot of money into other campaigns like the Trump campaign in the United States um, and disinformation in other Central Asian states or disinformation in, in, in other areas, if you want, of Russian interests. So utilizing this opportunity, it's, I see it as a very common policy with regards to what we might call as superpowers to utilize the infrastructure of the internet and pass on the messages that they want to pass. The difference between us, uh, meaning the West and Russia in this, case, in this case, is that there are rules and balances. There are checks and balances. There are rules and regulations. And there are attempts, like in the EU, like, like the United Nations, even NATO, uh, as an organization to where we should concentrate on and how we should defend. And that's why, for example, um, NATO has a hybrid threat uh, um, mechanism, if you want, and centers of excellence where people getting ready for, you know, for, for the way that they speak into the wider public. So I, I, I think I, would, I should stop here for, for with regard to this question. But, you know, w one of the things to, to take out, out of this is that there is a very big momentum and a very good opportunity to talk about the future of what constitutes the right information. Absolutely. And a, a sort of a, a, a huge and, and kind of seismic topic, if you will. Um, going back, just picking up a, a, a thread of what you were saying, Marius, um, how, you know, this is, you know, this, this kind of thing is always kind of a long time in the making. Um, Dinesh, I know that you kind of closely follow, um, not, you know, not perhaps not so much from the point of view of, of you know, perhaps the misinformation, but simply influence. And, um, you know, where influence is cropping up in the world and where we're seeing, you know, foreign influence in a region where we hadn't seen it before. I think specifically, I think you have a focus on um, uh, natural resources in Africa and uh, Chinese interest and influence there. Well, let's start with influence. Uh, 
I, I remember when I was an MEP in Brussels, there were about 25,000 pressure um, people who worked for pressure groups. And I'm sure they were all earning over 100,000 euros per annum each. That similar number is in most capitals of the world, most Western capitals of the world, if not all. And all these people are trying to influence in one way or another. And they are not uh, restricted by national boundaries. There are lots of people from outside using the same pressure groups who might be working for foreigners or working for, 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 for the, let's say, the English uh, or, or, or UK citizens. Of course, social media as well, the ether doesn't have boundaries. Unless, of course, you are like China and you say, I ban anything or block anything. And when you do that, your free press goes out of the window. Uh, and then democracy can be played around with. So we all need to get wealthy. We all need to, to work hard. We all need to uh, try and get what we can legally. And so the Chinese, for example, are, are big in Africa because of the natural resources of Africa. And that's fine. It's, it's you know, the, the Africans like that. They get money for it. And, and, and someone's at least uh, um, respecting them. But I know that Chinese influence in Africa is so far, is so great that they had a, a meeting of the 51 heads of state in Beijing, and Beijing gave them three months' notice, and 48 of them turned up. That just tells you something, that we in the West have overlooked Africa uh, and, and should, should, should do something there. But going back to Ukraine... Uh, you know, you can, I can take any view, but I can't understand why President Putin has now started targeting, uh, I mean, tried, just invading with, without talking. But I also, with the West, I mean, I also know that it takes two hands to clap and there's no smoke. I mean, it's not a one way deal, uh, but something's happened. And, uh, and, and Putin's decided this is the right time to go in. So influence can be on the ether, it can be milit military. Uh, and I can think of many, many countries in history or in the last 50 years that have gone in in one way or another uh, to, to influence uh, the weak, and we're all weak in one way or another, but and we can get influence. But I, I hope that and people do take advantage of that. That's simple. No, I, I think those are absolutely excellent points. And just just picking up on that, that last point that you made about influence and the way it is exerted in foreign countries is not a new thing. Like I say, we've had uh, very visible examples in, in, in recent years, whether that's kind of Russia being behind disinformation campaigns. And, you know, this is documented. This isn't my opinion. I'd just like to say uh, behind, for example, the Brexit campaign or the way Trump was voted in and, and other examples. But as you say, this is not a new thing. Um, you know, Marius, you know, speaking with your with your kind of NATO expert hat on, uh, you know, it's fair to say, isn't it, that there have been many examples, even prior to the digitization of information, even prior to social media, of you know, very visible examples of a more powerful country with big influence um, in its grip, exerting that influence elsewhere. Yeah, um, uh, uh, you see, in, when the 21st century started, okay, we called it the century of technology, while at the same time we by 99, 97, actually, Facebook comes along. And the opportunity for other, if you want start-up companies at the time, while the internet progresses, try to find a blend between social media and the internet and the use of the future by even introducing, if you want, the element of e-commerce. Because uh, social media basically are platforms that unite everything, people, artifacts, B2B, G2G, and so on and so forth. Then the legal status came for the establishment for a national level commerce of social media and what do those constitute. So there were a lot of voices, including mine, if you want, at least in the level of, of, 
military and NATO stuff. When I remember I was writing my PhD on about NATO Russia, where I was contemplating that NATO should put as a central pillar cybersecurity. Now, mind you, until that time, we have what is known as network-centric operations for deployment of, of military forces. We do not have a cybersecurity central command because it conflicts with legal elements, meaning what do nations share with regards to the national sovereignty elements and uh, defense measures and who's who and so on and so forth. Funnily enough, the ironically, I, I would say, the, the war against terror between 2001 and 2010 facilitated the exchange of more information about people, while in a parallel situation, social media started to develop even more. Then journalism came in where the, we found out the opportunity to get first prime feed or prime time information coming from all around the world through the utility of social media leading to today's world where, for example, somebody's tweet becomes a central key point where we do not really care about copyright or we do not care if this is actually true or not. Somebody tweets something, somebody takes it, somebody makes it big and so on and so forth. An example case. Uh, today I received a picture uh, which is a combination of 10 military um, um, uh, people being um, if you want, somebody caught them, right? So there are two people in Twitter. One is Ukrainian, pro-Ukrainian. The other one's pro-Russian, and they're showing the same thing, sh telling them that, hey, we caught Ukrainians. The other part says, hi, we caught Russians. And you really don't know what's happening. Now, take this and multiply it with the news. For example, what CNN and RT used to say is the same about the same story, two different lines, two different approaches. And at the same time, there is now the engagement of governments, especially important governments or, or you know, global powers or regional global powers, if you want, that they are attempting to utilize in order to promote their own, um, you know, uh, sustainable, if you want, foreign policy. Take that into perspective, considering the scarcity of natural resources. Take it within the grasp that, you know, there is unfinished business in areas such as Central Asia or the Middle East with regards to oh, the fight against ISIS, for example. Or you have cases like now you have Ukraine, Ukraine's um, unlawful invasion from Russia. All these things um, are used because we are trying to, A, feed information to the world, to provide the world with a clarity of, you know, who's who and why do they do that? Because it's not really clear for, for simple people to understand what is happening and why does it happen and where does it end mostly? Because a lot of people are fearful. They have taken to an extent that they're talking about World War III. Um, and, and, and number three, most important, there are governments that are attempting to take over other governments in order to point them out and put them in their own scale of attention. It is of no wonder that Putin is afraid of the European Union or NATO, because this, these are alliances of the many. So the more scarce these countries become, the more separate they become, the easier for Putin is to, to develop, if you want, his own policies in the region, the way that he contemplates in his own mind. Again, it was no coincidence that he utilized the media, the social media, and cyber attacks at the same time while his speech was recorded and was put on, on the news um, and, and by, by talking like Brezhnev did in, in the past periods for an hour and a half, trying to contemplate a historical perspective that would be multidimensional of attacks uh, that would never, you know, would never stop. So coming back to the idea, why do the social media and why do people use it and why international organizations need to use it is because, again, the, 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 the same answer goes with the previous one, because we need to provide the right and accurate information, not any kind of information. And I, I think that's you're absolutely right. I mean, the 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 sort of the 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 mismatch between you know the the need to deploy social media and yet the challenge that it presents is something it, you know it can be used as an instrument for good or you know for good or bad. And Dinesh, as you were saying earlier, social media is kind of you know this this sort of kind of information without boundaries, and it's very easy for things to go viral, and it's sort of democratized information in a way. You no longer have a journalist perhaps saying this is what I say it is because you have to trust me because of who I am and who I work for. Anybody can disseminate information, and that's both tremendous and dangerous. Um, Amanda, I just wanted to take uh, 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 Marius on, 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 on his uh, uh, 
point about accurate information. You know, it is so subjective. What is accurate is very subjective, and it's who is saying things. And, you know, it, uh, if you look at um, um, why certain countries uh, in the United Nations uh, behave in certain ways, one has to look at their background, their history, and, and why they're doing so, rather than just look at the fact today of what they've done. Uh, and I mean by that China and India, uh, for example, abstaining in, in the Security Council. And uh, uh, I, know, I'm, I don't know much about why, but I know there are a couple of things, and I wanted to point those out. One, that when the Americans uh, or the West were arming Pakistan, uh, they were not selling up, and India didn't have foreign exchange. So Pakistan was given their dollars for, for armaments, but India couldn't afford it because they didn't have foreign exchange. And the Russians turned around and said, we can do a rupee-ruble trade, and thus you can buy all the arms you, you like from us. And so the Russians armed the Indians, who could then fight the three wars that they had with the Pakistanis. Secondly, uh, whenever there was a, a plebiscite vote mentioned on Kashmir, the Russians always vetoed in the Security Council and helped India. I know those two things at least. I don't know about the rest. But so India can't just turn around and say, you know, we're not going to help you. And that's that. But I wanted to. So accurate information can be looked at in different ways. But the, the main thing that I want to say is, if you follow the money, you can't go far wrong. And no matter how you cloak following the money, it is following the money. And, and Amanda, I'd, I'd like to ask you to, to show the slides uh, that I'd sent earlier. Absolutely. One moment. Mm. Give me a moment and I will pull them up here. Okay, I'm going to share my screen with some slides of Dinesh's with some fascinating statistics. Okay. I, I would like to add something, but I would like to hear and see Dinesh's. <laughs> <laughs> but carry on talking, Marius. Oh, yeah, here. Uh, I don't want to divert. Because it's important what you're just saying. So uh, I just want to answer what it means by accurate information. Because I was talking more on a tactical base. Okay. So I just wanted to point out that, and I won't read everything, but it's the Ukraine is the first in Europe for uranium ore, uh, second in Europe in titanium, second in, in manganese, second in... In, in iron ore reserves, moving on, Amanda. Mm -hmm. uh, and you can read mercury ore, yeah. shell gas, natural resources, coal reserves, carry on. Then, as an agricultural country, arable land first, third with black soil. I know Romania has got black soil too. And those were the granaries of the East in the past, um, sunflower oil, etc. moving on, barley, corn, potatoes, rye, honey, and uh, we, you know what I'm saying, going on to industrialized country, ammonia production, very good for fertilizers, uh, gas, and so on. And then we move on to the next slide. Ore exporter, manufacturer, rocket launchers, turbines, nuclear, and so on. So it's not an, an unsubstantial country. It is just because the oligarchs kept stealing everything and, and, and the wealth didn't go to the state uh, per se, uh, 
these are great prizes to have for anyone. And while Ukraine was a country on its own for, for, for 17 or 24 years, I've forgotten exactly, they were selling most of it to Russia. And by the way, they owed Russia over $100 billion. Then 2014 happens with Crimea, and the West offers $2.5 billion, you know, which was a, a, a pittance. And so the Ukrainians were supposedly in the Russian orbit when it came to natural resources. And when they started looking westward, perhaps that might have been the reason why Putin decided, I want those resources. So my, my point about following the money. Can I, can I add here some things? Mm -hmm. It's going to be quite interesting what I'm going to say, I think. The first three, the first three parts that you've shown mm -hmm. are the same reasons why uh, NATO got involved into Kosovo. It got also the same thing why NATO got involved in Afghanistan besides the war against terror. So these are important areas and elements that provide natural resources. And that's why I said in, in the initial speech uh, that natural resources, the, the war natural resources, really expanding now more than ever because of climate change, because of the attempt of sustainability, which, however, we need some raw materials in order to be able to sustain something. So... Um, that's very important. The other thing is with regards to Ukraine, that we should not forget World War II and the invasion of Ukraine by Nazis and the attempt by the Soviets to gain control of Ukraine because Nazi Germany wanted Ukraine in order to be able to feed its troops. So Ukraine is really important for feeding of the troops, as we call it, and metals and, and, and all the things that you should provide it. Now, the even more interesting thing, I don't know if a lot of people know about that, that is that in Nenopetrovsk, which is basically the oblast western to Donetsk, about 3 million hectares is owned or rented out to China since 2013. Wow. And, uh, yeah, because of agricultural demands. Um, and uh, it's, it's been there for a while, uh, as I said, 2013. Now, the story, the interest about Ukraine is besides the $200 billion, which you're actually right, absolutely right, because it was always in the sphere of influence of, Ukraine, of, of, of Soviets. Um, it has to do uh, with the fact that uh, Ukraine... Um, was asked in 2009 and 2011 the renewal of the presence of the Russian fleet in the Black Sea, which was based out of Crimea. And the Ukrainian government at that time twice rejected it. And then Putin was telling him, hey, you owe me money. They said, hey, we're not going to give you money. And then if you remember, there was a, 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 a peak, a, a, an upsell of prices in gas and petrol going through Ukraine from Russia. And uh, that was the very first time that Putin actually, and Medvedev, I think it was at that time, uh, told him, hey, we're going to invade you guys if you don't do something. And then they said, well, no, we're going to have a Euro-Atlantic future to come. So the, the discussion has been going on since 2009. It is not new. The events that took place on a strategic point of view become 2014. And then again, as I said, going back to the initial discussion on the foreign interference in local affairs start to get get more more and more evident now funnily enough russia has been trying to do that with serbia uh by serbia becoming neutral if you want in the new era uh where even serbia is still i think neutral considering ukraine is what's happening um especially because they they see similarities with kosovo like the greeks see with cyprus um in, in the terms of attack You're frozen. You're frozen. Okay. Um, I, I, Amanda, I, I just wanted to say that the Russians, I mean, Marius mentioned the the Russian fleet in the mm -hmm. Black Sea. Yeah. And uh, I thought, and Marius can correct me if I'm wrong, that the Russians had a lease on Odessa wow. and the Crimea, or, or, or the port at least. Oh, Sorry, sure. Marius. Yeah. Uh, I think I, I, something happened. I don't know. It was just a minute ago. Uh, uh, so, Russian interference. Oh, I, 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 okay. Russian interference. Uh, maybe, maybe. Uh, you never know. No, no, I'm kidding. I'm uh, kidding. The, the, the idea is that Russia always had an idea of the map as it projects to its own world. And I will explain what I mean by this. 
In 2014, I was in Donetsk and Luhansk. As I said, before the war erupted, just a few days or about a week before it erupted. That was number one. Number two, I had visited Moscow after that. And I had given a lecture as a professor at Migi Mo. I was invited by one of my colleagues to give uh, a speech. But what was interesting was the level of the students and their preparedness with regard to geopolitical landscape understandings and the natural resources and so on and so forth. It is also interesting to say that lately they did another um, another department, if you want to call it, the geopolitical, geographical landscape. And they started talking about basically the near abroad of Russia and how Russia sees and projects the, the east, the west, and the south. These are not, the, this is not just a common decision of an academic to do, especially Migi Mo or Lavrov and Medvedev and other people graduated from there uh, and other European leaders that may support Russia today or um, other non-European, if you want. What is interesting to say is that for the Russians, interference starts from education, starts from ideology, continues to technology, the use of technology, and comprehension of international law the way that it is. And this is exactly why, why the United Nations Security Council cannot take a solid decision, because the way that the Russians anticipate the world is exactly different the way that the Western world anticipates the Russians. And as long as this continues, we will always have methodologies and dimensions of battles, whether this is through the media or social media or interference in, in, in local affairs and so on and so forth. Russia has its hand in the Mediterranean as well. Russia has its hand in Central Eastern Europe with, uh, with Transnistria and Abkhazia and Georgia. Don't forget what happened in Georgia in 2008. I mean, they, they literally walked in until Tbilisi. Uh, and they can do that again. Don't really forget what happened in between Armenia and Azerbaijan recently, where Armenia had a defense pact with Russia, and Russia didn't do anything because the Armenians put up the European and Euro-Atlantic flag. So what is actually taking place is an application of another methodology of interference in local and regional now affairs, I would add. So I was just mentioning, Marius, um, when you got cut off for a bit, about the Black Sea fleet uh, that you mentioned earlier. And uh, I thought that, uh, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, that uh, uh, Russia had a lease on Odessa for till 2055 or something. No, no, no. It had, it had a lease with the existing force, not with an upscale force. They claimed that they had a reason to believe that they need to upscale their powers. And in their attempt of the strategic understanding to renew, they need to have more forces attached. And the Ukrainians were afraid of that. Okay. So, so what the year is correct, 2055? That was the attempt, but now they claim it's theirs. No, no, no. What I'm saying is that that's what they had earlier. And what was the increase in force? Surely there has to be progress in when, when he came, and all that sort of thing. He came with 40,000 strong. He came with multiple warships, okay. um, helicopters, planes, and he came quite peacefully. If you're, you remember Putin in front of the boat, he was coming in the, in the port. Uh, there was, uh, it was the most, uh, if you want, peaceful invasion that ever happened within a land that, that does not belong to them because they put literally all their forces in. He actually left with Aeroflot after that. And, the, I, and is it also true, and thanks for correcting me on that, but is it also true that 98% of the people there are Russian? They're, Russo, they're Russophones. Um, okay, so the, the, the discussion between who's Russian and who's not dates back centuries with regards okay. to the... So, so they're basically uh, leaning towards Russia rather than to the... I mean, okay, somebody gives you from 50 euros a week, gives you 100 euros uh, a week, plus a certainty of job, plus, a, you know, at that time, if you want much more power... I'm not going to the causes. I'm just saying. <laughs> that, 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 that's, that's exactly what he did, what he did in Donetsk and Luhansk. He no, didn't so, no I, I just wanted to clarify that, and you have. But what's important here is that if I was a, a, a large power... You know, I would want Mediterranean access, Black Sea access, as well as on the north. You know, it's not that only large powers of the west want this. It's also large powers of the east want it. So, yeah, of 
course, and that's why that's why they have their they. If you remember during a sad period of time, now now ISIS and and, and the the attacks in Syria, he made a pact with Assad, and he he put more troops there, and he protected him. That's why Assad is still there in Syria. Can, the can, can I also ask another question, which because you might know this this answer, but before the Iraq attack um, by the West, forty nine percent of all Iraqi oil was owned by the French and the Russians. Luke oil, and I think uh, petrol. Is that correct? Okay. You got me there. Okay. I think you got so me there. The uh, whole point was that there were these. That during Saddam Hussein's period of time, they were having extremely good relations as well with Europeans and Americans. Oh, with the French, I know that um, Donald Rumsfeld was selling arms. Yeah, with the, with the French, the French were the last to leave. Total was the last to leave. Correct. So Iraq. Total and Luke Oil were the two companies. Yeah, that yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But Luke Oil was never was never so powerful at the time okay. to to be at the level that it was. If you want, so to there was something. foreign interference from yeah, the, and from, and from, from the French and, other people. and from the Russians in yeah. Iraq. But, um, but the, the problem was who controls what in terms of of, of, of Iraq. Well, if I control 49% of the oil, I, I have some inter- some leverage. There, there was a... um, I'm sorry, Dinesh, I wanted to say, I think this goes back to your point about follow the money. Yes. Wasn't yeah. It? yeah, but there is a stronger, there was a stronger country that also got into ruins. That was Libya. Well, that's the second. Libya was the second. True. That's true. Yes, I mean, Libya is, a, I don't know what it is like now, but it's a bit of a mess, isn't it? Yeah. Well, yeah, you can say that. <laughs> uh, it's a non-ending story. These are conflict zones. These are conflict zones. I, again, this has to do with the with the discussion and it's been years as a conflict zone. Years. Yeah, but this is one of the successful stories for NATO uh, with with regards to the um, to the no-fly zones. It also has to do with the success stories with regards to Europe trying to provide, if you want, more stability to Libya because it wants its export of oil. And at the same time, it cares about what's taking place in the south in Mali and also Niger because of the extreme terrorist groups that are there. But Libya uh, was a Libya was a, a strong country. I mean, it, it had an industry. It had, you know, it, it's all yeah, around. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and Greeks, Greeks, Italians and Spanish had a huge stake on it. Uh, I know that Greeks, they own Greeks more more than eight or nine billion dollars in construction work. And actually, uh, Greece tried to balance this. Italy tried to balance this. Um, uh, Gaddafi's companies were based out of Cyprus and Italy as well. Um, so these these things were really like, if, if you want to follow the money and see how the flow of the money goes. It is of no coincidence, for example, that during the counter-terrorism war of George Bush, um, uh, you, you would junior. You would see that uh, he said, "Follow the money" in order to trace where the money goes and through where. Today, all these financial constraints that they put to the Russians has very much to do so with an intelligence sharing and understanding of where the money circulates and how. When you have the European SIPA, where you have the European anti fraud laws, these are more regulatory laws above the fraudulent activities because somebody... I'll, tell, I'll tell you a story uh, with with Libya. A friend of mine was doing civil works, you know, uh, build cities, etc. And um, he was paid with a tanker... Oh, God. He was paid with a tanker full of oil. And and when it was on the, on the sea to Rotterdam, the oil price doubled... Yeah. So he was laughing all the way to the bank. But there you mm-hmm. go. You know, this is a true story, and I, I know the guy. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, it gets it gets even better. What about ship owners moving and transporting uh, crude oil during the period of time, and how much it would cost to move from point A to point B? And by the time they reach the port, the price has changed. That's what exactly happened. And it and it also depends on the what you call the structure of the futures market. If that happens to move in your favor, your that oil will make money, even if the price doesn't necessarily move. All these, all these things have very much to do so with how you regulate the global market shares and how people understand investment and how people understand the risk assessments associated with this. And there, how how do you connect these with war, for example, now in Ukraine? Mm-hmm. Okay, well, Marius, you can't you can't keep regulating. Otherwise, we'll be living in a communist country. Because if you're regulating, you are dead. 
Well, then what is the point? What is the point of skill, brains, and someone making money out of it? You can't just stand um, I, sorry, I just I just wanted to, to to just sort of circle back a little bit, um, kind of on the point of you know the sort of flows and how kind of often life you know some parts of side business is business as usual no matter what. You know we've seen the price of natural gas in Europe spike to record levels, sixty percent in a day in Rotterdam in the UK, and yet. Flows of gas from Russia through Nord Stream 1 have continued unabated throughout yeah. all of this. Um, Why? Why? Because if it stops, then you have World War III. Then you really well. Then, then I guess you do. Just going back, I wanted to go to back to your your. Um, you know, I think it's it's so fascinating about the different what constitutes interference, the difference. You know, whether that's corporate, whether it's political, whether it's cyber warfare. Going back to what you were saying though, um, Marius, on interference, and you said at least with Russia, it starts with education. <laughs> It starts with technology and the methodology that, that you know, with the, they then deploy that. It isn't just something that um, someone somewhere flicks a switch and hacks a computer. I mean, obviously, of course, it's not. But if it's that ingrained, if it's that kind of grassroots, how does the, how does the West or, let's say, anybody that doesn't wish to be subject to outward interference, because I imagine that isn't just the case in Russia, it is elsewhere. How do you safeguard against that? How do you protect yourself? I'm a European baby, and in a, as a European baby, I grew up in Brussels in the European school of Brussels one, um, where uh, actually what I do know is Boris Johnson was also at some period of time for a few years there when he was a, a child, uh, and others, and uh, the, the president of the European Commission, I think, right now, um, was also there. So, you know, the, the Europeans, I think, in, in terms of education, because now we're moving into the educational part, into the European integration of education, what constitutes. It's quite different from one country, because these are 27 right now. I mean, um, the 27 countries have different needs and different regulations and authorities and different ministries that regulate this. But within the spectrum, we I remember also in university, we did European integration classes. We did European uh, methodologies and how to get closer to each other and stuff. But we didn't even hit the, the main parts, which are the values, the ethics, the geography, the philosophies, the histories behind it, the geographical perspectives, the importance, for example, of a solid market economy and how this would be an energy security for Europe and so on and so forth. But rather we discussed this at the level of European decision makers, the, 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 you know, the level that, that Dinesh was, was there the European Parliament or the European Commission. The European Union has a top-down approach, it seems, in, in those things, where, in fact, we need to understand that the north, south, east, and west of the European Union does not have the same, um, you know, infrastructures or challenges or elements that, you know, binds us together in terms of education. What we do have are... Um, scientific elements, for example, um, engineering, architecture, medicine, uh, anything like with related with technology and space, which actually unites people more. But on the theoretical or historical perspectives, countries see their national interests still. And that's why a lot of times you hear Europeans saying we need more Europe, more integration, more solid history mm -hmm. and stuff. History, uh, Russia doesn't have such problems of history. Russia mm -hmm. knows two things, Charis Russia, communist Russia, ideologies, and then we we'll go straight to philosophies, literature, geography, mathematics, law, international law, application of the powerful, balances of power. How do you apply this? And then, for example, when you go to the diplomatic academy and you get, you know, you get trained as a diplomat, you see Lavrov, for example, how he, he takes things and, and, and change them. The, these are ways of doing propaganda, and these are elements and characteristics that only few westernized countries used to do that for many, many years. And no wonder, for example, you got Britain or the U.S. or Germany or now Holland, for example, as key center points of, of modern style education, whether this is in political science or in international affairs or things that, you know, they, they bonded together, whereas the South, that I know better, if you want, could not bind this but they were binding themselves into more you know the you know that we need architectural designs we need mm -hmm. doctors we need lawyers but they could not combine these elements together imagine that with my students when when i, I you know when i have my students i used to tell them that you need to know a bit of everything and you need to be able to explore things outside the classrooms to understand and fit Mm -hmm. to this global discussion on civilizational needs, to what the investor needs, to what the politician needs as a decision maker or as an advisor. 
you need to know about those things. And for example, you need to know about Ukraine before you actually take a judgment. Why was Ukraine? Of course. Um, yeah. um, I was just going to say thank you, Maris. I just wanted to kick this to, to Dinesh. And, you know, if I could possibly ask you to respond with your kind of, you know, you have been a decision maker. You've been a lawmaker. So just What's going back on to uh, education in Russian classrooms. I mean, they, the victors always write history. And the victors, and the Russian classroom is actually internal. It's not being um, uh, influenced by outside powers. They say, this is history, and this is how it's going to be taught. And that's fine. The Chinese do the same, uh, and everyone else should do the same. So uh, I, I'm not that worried. As regards gas prices, by the way, they've tripled. Uh, they haven't gone up 60%. They've tripled. Oh, no, that was uh, maybe in a, in a day. No, they've yeah, tripled. They been. Been but I'll come than back to that. Mm -hmm. uh, we saw our build. Uh, the, 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 the strengths of the southeast, west, and north that you were talking about, Marius, need to be taken into account, not the weaknesses. Uh, but the problem is that countries are being, uh, sorry, politicians in the EU are being elected from countries. And thus they will only look at their country's influence, or they will want to work for their electorate. If it was regions which covered more than two or three countries, it'd be different. Now, for example, you could have a European grid for energy. Wind in the north, solar in the south. Wind, we all know, works in the winters. Solar works well in the summers. Wind during the night, solar during the day. Perfect. You know, so... Back to, to gas prices, I have a solar project in Romania, which I own, where I have 360 hectares of land, and I'm going to plaster it with solar panels. What has this done, the Russian invasion, for me? And I'm not trying to in any way be, you know, uh, say I'm, I'm laughing, but this has given an impetus for Europe to not be reliant on Russian gas no matter if the gas is flowing or not. Mm. So we're going to be, the people are going to be pushing us to get things done, and here's the money, and do it, etc. So the, the other thing that might happen is Hungary and Poland, who are having a, a dispute on law with the EU, will stop, because they're so afraid of the Russians walking in there. You know, yeah, Poland already stopped. And the whole host of things are going to be done uh, different in the EU. And there was so much time wasting because it's a democracy. So mm -hmm. those were the three or four things I wanted to tell you about uh, prices. Thank Can you. I, oh, yeah. oh, sorry, Marius. I just wanted to say we have two minutes left until our session is sadly over. I was, I, we've, there's, we've covered so much ground today. I'd like to ask both of you to maybe take a minute each to perhaps give our, 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 one, our, our wonderful audience and attendees who have been listening to what we've been chatting about, give them a takeaway. Um, Marius, if I could start with you, you have a minute. In a minute. Uh, <laughs> I really hope that war ends and I really hope it doesn't spill over. Uh, I really hope that the Europeans are working in a much more constructive way. Uh, yes, people are elected, but if you see who is elected, under which conditions they're elected, they're much more elected because they're popular rather than because they have the capability to do that. So we, I still believe that we need more strong leadership. We need more Europe. Uh, what, what Mr. Dinesh said uh, with regards to we need to look at the strengths, he's absolutely right. But uh, when at this point we see the weaknesses, of the European Union, whether we like it or not. Um, I think we, you know, external interference will not stop from Russia, will not stop from anybody who sees that the next best thing is the European Union. And I think this is exactly why it's happening. So I'll stop here. Thank you. That, that was almost bang on a minute. Thank you. <laughs> Finish. Over to you. Uh, well, the, the scrooge of interference, of foreign interference, will carry on, as Marius just said. It is impossible not to, to happen, but we must guard against it. We must see that there are always two sides to a story, like there are in a court case. And, you know, you've got to be able to... It takes two hands to clap, and the Russians are, have really gone over the top. I think this is just pathetic, what they've done. But our side, 
the West also has done this in the past. And I'm not saying if I've killed someone, you must kill someone. But I am saying that, please, look, there are always two sides to every story. So uh, thank you very much, Amanda, for yeah. comparing, moderating, and uh, being sure. such a nice person. Oh, I thank you both so much for your time today. I mean, I realized that our panel was going to be four. It, you've, we've been down, circumstances have been our control. We're down to two, but I have loved it. I've learned so much. I think I can't thank you both enough for your insights, for your stories, for your experience, and just everything you shared with us today. And thank you also to everybody that's tuned in to listen. Um, you know, panels are only panels if, you know, uh, we have panelists. But also what makes it is the people that tune in and listen and take something valuable away from this. And I, I certainly feel that I'm going to today. Thank you all so much. Have a good weekend and hopefully see you again sometime soon. Thank you. Thank you. Much appreciated. Bye. Thank you. Bye.